Hi, welcome to the channel. Today we are going to be discussing book tropes and specifically popular book tropes on book talk. Why we love them, why we hate them, why we can't get enough of them. So come on, sit down, grab a snack and uh, stay tuned. So I'm going to be focusing on four different tropes today and maybe if I enjoy the way this video turns out we will do more in the future. So the four tropes that I kind of want to stick to for this video is enemies to lovers, which we all know and we all love, love triangles, found families, and the chosen one. Now, I kind of want to do a generalized definition for you guys. So in front of me, I have that a trope is a plot structure, theme, storyline, character trait, motif, or plot device that is commonly used in storytelling. All right, so for the very first one, enemies to lovers, we all know it, we all love it. Um, ha, to talk about why this is popular is such an interesting question because I think it, I think it really stems from the idea that um, whenever I'm reading a book that's like so very obviously enemies to lovers, it's almost like it kind of makes you giddy to like think about, okay, how are they about to go from hating each other to wanting to jump each other's bones? Do you know what I mean? Like that weird way that you can let us a author can kind of just weave a story together I think it's so magical and I think that's what makes enemies lovers so special is because there's such a fine line between making that kind of plot line and trope believable and for a reader to be like oh this makes sense or you read something and you're like oh he always liked her even though he wanted to kill her and he would have he always liked her <laughs> so I think that's also something that is kind of cute to take away from that um trope um, I do want to talk about some books that I've read that kind of encapsulated the tropes very well. The first thing I want to touch on is Throne of Glass. Now I, if you guys follow me, I just read the very first book in Throne of Glass. You can check out my reading blog up here. So I've only read the first book so please no spoilers down below. But um, from the very first book I read it just feels so like obviously in Beast Lovers because you have your main character Selena. She's an assassin. No one likes her. Everyone hates her. Thinks she's a bad person. And you have these other two main characters, which honestly, we can go ahead and um, bring in Love Triangle because it also feels like a love triangle as well. But we have Selena and we have um, Kale. And Kale, that whole book, just literally internally is like, oh, I hate her. Or oh, she's a bad person. We can't trust her. I can't let my guard down. But oh, she's so pretty. She's so this. She's so that. So I think it's the way that authors kind of sprinkle in um, hints that uh, characters like each other. Also, I want to say that I really, really hate when, I don't know if it's authors or whoever is doing this, but whenever someone claims that the book is enemies to lovers, and then you see the book, and you're like, this is an office romance. Now, granted, I don't even read those kind of books, but like I've definitely heard of that happening. And just the idea that you could label a book enemies to lovers or attempt to market the book that way, I think it's so weird because in my opinion, enemies to lovers means that you want to kill each other and you will and you've thought about it and you are ready to do it at like a moment's notice. You are ready to kill each other. Like that's what that means to me when I think of enemies to lovers. It means that, for example, you know, a person has been conditioned and taught to hate this other person because of X, Y, and Z, you know, because of their species or because of their beliefs or because of what they've done to their people in the past. Something so big and so otherworldly has happened to where this person like literally wants to kill you. And that to me is kind of, um, is indicative of a good enemies. And then you can kind of make that blossom into lovers. So Throne of Glass, I can already tell that it's doing a really good job of like enemies to lovers. Also, um, we can talk about Red Rising. Now, I don't have the first book with me. I do have the other two. But Red Rising is like sci-fi fantasy. It also has a pretty good um, enemies to lovers in there. It's definitely not the number one trope of the book. So if you do, you know, plan on picking those books up, don't, you know, presume to think that enemies to lovers is the largest plot point within the book because it's not it's like the sixth but it's still like when it happens it's like satisfying um but I would still recommend those books because that is like my favorite my top two favorite like book series love them um let's see next I'll do love triangles so for love triangles 
Uh, first of all, I think I love a good love triangle because I think it is, I think it's natural to be attracted to other people, right? You're, granted, you're not in relationships with any of them at this point. I think it's natural to um, find multiple, pe multiple people attractive at once. Um, especially when you're like friends because that's how like love triangles like when they kind of start forming in books it's almost like you can see these two friends that she has or you can see these two people she just recently met and she's not um she hasn't done anything romantic with either of them but she can but she enjoys each of their companies for different reasons and I think that's so interesting to me because it's almost like the butterfly effect like they both want you it's usually a girl and two guys it's i it's so weird. I don't really think I read a lot of one guy, two girls, which they should make more of that because why not? But I don't read a lot about that. Um, all the ones I read are always one girl, two guys. And I think that it's almost like fun because when you're reading the book, you're just, you, you find yourself rooting for one guy and you're like, oh my God, I hope he gets her. I hope he, I hope he uh, gets to fall in love and I hope he gets to be happy. Um, but someone's heart always gets broken and usually it's both hearts at you know whether one gets healed at some point or another usually everyone gets heartbroken at some point throughout the love triangle um let's see some examples within books i say um the natural series which is a book series i am still not done with i have read the first two books and there's one left um but that's also a love triangle we have um it's like teens and they're kind of like um it's like criminal minds but teens that's what the books is about and um, I have her main character and she moves into this house full of other teens who kind of have special abilities that the FBI likes to utilize. And so she becomes friendly with two of the guys there and it's very obvious that she likes them. And it's very obvious that they're both attractive and it's very obvious that something is going to happen. <laughs> so I like those kind of love triangles. Um, but to get a little deeper, my favorite, I find myself always choosing the guy, um, like for who I want her to be with. I always end up choosing the one who is secretly yearning, like the one who is um, more quiet than the other. For example, reading Throne of Glass, um, that first book, like you get, you get a sense of Dorian's personality and he's very open, he's very funny, he's very flirty and he doesn't care about the rules and he talks to Selena in you know certain ways that the other guy would never do. Kale is very grounded, closed off. He's the royal guard. He has his um, job title and he's going to do his job to the T and he's going to do his best not to be taken aback by her beauty and by the fact that she is kind of just a girl. <laughs> and um, there's something so like sad and beautiful about reading Kale's plotline. I mean, Kale's like internal dialogue when he's thinking about her because you can tell he's like silently and quietly yearning for her without ever telling her. And it's like so sad. And it makes me think of um, Twilight, which never read, but I have seen the movies. It makes me think of that because, um, I don't know, you could just tell that Jacob always wanted her. But I will say, that I think that's one love triangle example that I hate. Like I love like a good a, lo a good love triangle is fun, but they can get really bad when it's done in the way that Twilight did it. <laughs> like I said, have not read the book, so I don't know how different they are from the movies. But specifically talking about the movies, I think it's really annoying to call it a love triangle or to create a love triangle where the girl never even saw the other guy as a fucking option. <laughs> like, come on. How are we even calling Twilight a love triangle? Bella never wanted Jacob ever, ever. She was never even thinking about being with that man, ever. That was never a thought in her mind. Are you kidding me? Bro, as soon as fucking Edward left, she was like depressed and she was like, well, guess I'll hang out, with Ed guess I'll hang out with Jacob. It wasn't real. This guy was yearning from the fucking ends of the earth for her. And it was never going to happen. It was never going to be real. He was never had a chance. And I hate those kind of love triangles when you know so clearly how disinterested she is in one of the guys. 
Like if I'm gonna read Love Triangle, it better be like tit for tat. Like it better be like I can tell she likes both of them for different reasons, but she likes both of them. You know what I mean? Not this. Oh, I can't have him, so I'll I'll, I'll go hang out with him. No, 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 no. That's not a good love triangle in my opinion because it's so obvious who she'll be end up with, and it's quite depressing to watch that to watch a guy just so obviously sit there and never get anything but crumbs. <laughs> like that's sad. <laughs> Like, that is so fucked up. <laughs> okay, the next trope I have is found family. Now, this is one of my favorite tropes ever because um, it's so beautiful. And I think the reason why people love it, why I love it, is because I think it really harps on the fact that you can be in a, you can find yourself in a shit situation. You can find yourself you know, growing up in a place that doesn't love you, respect you, care for you. And you can go out and you can find um, a spot in the world that does care for you. It does love you. You can find people that you would die for. And I think that is so like poetic. I don't know. Something about that is so poetic. Um, and we kind of see found families specifically found in fantasy books. And I think doing that is so smart because when you're reading a fantasy book, you know, sometimes when you're reading it, you're reading about these giant worlds and this magic system and these kingdoms that don't exist in the real world, would never exist in the real world. And sometimes it can be hard to put yourself in that situation. It can be hard to um, empathize and sympathize with the main character. But when you as an author are smart enough to throw in some real life problems that your readers are going to be going through and for them to read that book and feel that on the page that that fake character who's in a magical place is also going through is so smart it's so smart because it grounds it it grounds that character as a real person and that's definitely something that you need to do when it comes to fantasy because you already have this fantastical world that is going to be impossible for a reader to truly grasp because it's not real but when you are smart enough to put in a situation that real people go through, where real people grow up in families or situations where they are not respected, not loved, not cared for, and they have to go and search out and look for someone who will love them, care for them, whatever that case is. Like, I think that's really, I think it's really cool when you read that. Um, and it's also very uplifting because it kind of reminds you that just because you started somewhere and just because you're in this horrible situation, it doesn't mean that you're destined to stay there. And it doesn't mean that you can't crawl your way out of there and find a better situation and find a found family. <laughs> and so that is why that's one of my favorite plot lines, um, tropes. Um, some examples also is Red Rising again, this whole trilogy is found family. We have this main character who um, he kind of pretends to be a different species than he is. And because of that, he's kind of thrust into this different world where he has to kind of fake himself and pretend to be someone he isn't. And throughout the series, we kind of see him become best friends with people and find his family. And it's so beautiful to see that happen. It's so like rewarding to read a book and be like, oh my God, he would die for you. Like, oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that so much. Okay. So the next trope is chosen one now this one is interesting because it has been around since the dawn of time you can find it in so many i would say most fantasy books you can find this trope in um for example harry potter lightning thief i will say i have never read lightning thief <laughs> i have seen like two episodes of the new show and when it comes to Harry Potter, I read the first two books and I saw the first two movies, but I've never read or watched any more of it. But I can tell from even just that little bit from each of those kind of worlds that they are both chosen one characters. Um, and I think that trope is just still going strong today because it's so like, I don't know, is the word, is it easy? I don't know if it's easy, but it's like so, um, maybe the word is like, you're just so used to it and I think that sometimes when it comes to fantasy you have this big bad evil and you also need a a hero and I think one of the most used ways um 
most understood ways is to use the chosen one trope. Now, while I was looking up some of this information, I found it quite interesting because I wanted to look up, you know, different books that kind of exemplified the chosen one trope. And one book that they pointed out was Hunger Games, which had me ponder because I would love to kind of start a discussion down below of what you guys think because I don't know if I agree. <laughs> um, so with Hunger Games, I have seen all the movies except Ballads of Songbirds and Snakes um, and I've read all the books all of them. And so with that knowledge and with that kind of world and those movies being like one of my favorite kind of movie, movie franchises ever, I have seen them so many times. So when I was looking this up and when they had Hunger Games under Chosen One Trope, I kind of got a little confused because I still don't agree with that. Now, they were saying that Katniss Everdeen kind of exemplified the idea of a chosen one character because she had like all of the characteristics that she would need to kind of take down the capital. So they said that she had wit, grit, determination, and a protective nature, and the capital never really stood a chance. So as much as I agree with that sentence, I don't think that that means she's the chosen one. I don't know, maybe I'm thinking about it in the wrong way, but um, I found this other trope. There's this other trope um, and it's called the reluctant hero. And the reluctant hero is when the protagonist just wants to be left alone, but is pulled into the adventure anyway. And I feel as if that better explains her character than the chosen one. Because if we remember, if we think clearly on this, right? She always hated the capital. She was never going to be in the games until she, of course, volunteered for her sister, even in the games. She, I mean, she hated it. She didn't like any part of it. She didn't want to be the rebellion, the face of the rebellion. She didn't want to be the Mockingjay. Like, there was never anything she wanted to do. Even in the movies, the books, um, when we finally got to Mockingjay, like, she was like, why did you save me? You should have saved Pita. I don't want to do this. I don't want any part of your revolution. I don't want any part of your rebellion. I just want to go home to my sister and the people that I love. And I literally want to be left alone. So I don't know. I just find that interesting. I would love to kind of start a discussion down below. Let me know, would you consider Katniss Everdeen a chosen hero or a reluctant hero? And that is going to be where I leave you guys off with in this video. But thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to comment down below, subscribe to my channel, and let me know any more video ideas you have for me. Okay, bye.